good morning good afternoon and good evening ladies and gentlemen welcome to the first health and history event for the york hope consortium i am dr suranga dolamulla from university of york i also work as a clinical academic fellow at the york hospital trust uk and a senior medical administrator at the ministry of health sri lanka Today's topic is the faith-based organization and COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I just want to mention that one of the main objectives of the York Hope Consortium is to investigate on hope and health. On the other way, how does the experience of the pandemic shape perspectives of hope across the local, national, and global scale? Secondly, how do multilateral organizations, national and sub-national government, religion organizations, and community organizations think about the think about hope? As everybody knows that the term faith-based organization is more inclusive than term religious organization. Therefore, I hope this will be investigated. along with the pandemic during this seminar today we have three panelists uh, professor kalinga tudor silva dr vinay aryaratna and sudarma virakodi uh, let me invite uh, sudarma first and uh, sudarma is a qualified teacher and is doing her phd at university of birmingham she started off as a biology teacher and led specialized in a fashion of the teacher of the special needs uh the most important fact is she is a practicing buddhist and is a curriculum designer for both uk and sri lanka she is also a teacher in a, a dharma pahasala which is a buddhist school for children So it's over to you, Sudarma. Good afternoon. Uh, are you born? Good. Um, from our natural and homely greeting of saying "I born" itself is giving us hope in our health. When we meet and greet, we say "Wish you long life with love and happiness." As I say it, keeping my hands together. near near to my heart this greeting become a new norm instead of shaking hands this itself give gives you your project health and hope a meaningful beginning i think as um, as a, as a first conversation in the series of uh, this timely topic i was asked to speak about faith based based organizations in and their role in sri lanka during the covid-19 pandemic i live in london in the united kingdom and i'm a buddhist so as a as i'm a practical mm. buddhist by all means i respect and include any good practice from any faith religion and culture while working in a british education system as a multi faith community also um i think i better speak um in my personal experience um living in the uk as a um, sri lankan buddhist i could say um also growing and studying in the most multicultural school in sri lanka as a young girl um in st paul's milagiri girls school in colombo i have practiced loving kindness from the beginning of my education this growing helped me as a victim of covid-19 to cope and stand up to talk about this disastrous disease today i would like to talk about this topic health and hope from my own experience as a sri lankan my talk today is based on personal experience instead of an academical viewpoint how did the faith based um, activities took part in our lives 
help facing the pandemic. Naturally, um, humane and normal to feel pressurized when suddenly people face into unexpected house bounding. There is no going back to work, going to work, to schools and kind of social activities. People are dying here and there everywhere. The whole world became significant amount of, um, the whole world became a cemetery in a few weeks. No one could understand the truth of what's, what was going on. When such significant amount of population has been affected by common misfortune of virus was described in various definitions. Some, some faiths describe this global pa pandemic was an effect of a collection of karma that has been accumulated by us in the past. And this is certainly not the first time in pandemic as like um, this has struck in this world. If we look back into the history, we will find during the Siddhartha Gautama Buddha's time, there was a, there was a, a, a time they had uh, disasters in Vishala city. Buddha chanted Ratana Sutra, which spread loving kindness to help, to calm the panic and anxiety. Chanting Sutra um, and giving everyday worship time broadcasts from temples has happened in the UK every day, evening, even in the morning and also in the evening puja sessions. This showed very clearly that people do not need to visit the place of worship, but the resident monks, nuns and priests have done daily casts on Zoom, Google Meet or other platforms. Priests, priests had had to educate themselves to use this uh, new normality and they really were accepting the, and fine with it. We made temples in our heart in homes and practice more and more. In Buddhist societies, priests were always there with the public and giving the spiritual support they, they need, they need and needed. And the history goes to the Buddha's time when, we, when there was a famine and other hard times. It has not changed even today. Despite the boundaries of social distancing and the other issues, they, they, they were there for us during this extraordinary time. People who can never be into the temples and places of worship were able to attend to the spiritual activities as, um, as a family even from one device. The, the transportation hardships, times and the other activities and the boundaries which weren't there anymore. Huge amount of people are attending pujas and worships without any hesitation and in their own com comfort zones. This has given an opportunity to participate live for people who are not well, elderly and disabled, even as a COVID victim, which world became a small temple to me in front of a rectangle screen. There you go with the connection to the world. Most people said the physical connection is less, but psychological, emotional and spiritual connection made easy and convenient. Faith-based organizations have done still, still spiritual connection made easy and convenient. Faith-based organizations have done still kind of um, keep doing this virtual, but heartiest bridging the gap of faith community, faith and community fantastically. I'm, I'm one of the virtual worshipers in different faith-based organizations. Uh, in and around London, our Buddhist, uh, London Buddhist Vihara, Dhamma Center, Lecture Temples, Thames Temple and uh, other not named temples have done this beautifully, religiously and very strongly. They made us happy and connect with the real world on a screen. 
spiritual well-being gives the psychological immunity, which is helping the ongoing catastrophe uh, now and for years. Now, now and from two years and still to the future. I think um, as Buddhists, we practice meditation. Meditation and being mindful is calming and processing mindful acts to react the issues uh, rising up in the present moment. So people from all around the world became one small meditation room in Zoom and other platforms together with social connections to heal the world, world agony with good loving kindness and social breathing for togetherness. Good practice makes strong vibes and good auras to help healing human beings with other places of worship has done world connectivity meditation days in pandemic times. I remember few of them, participating few of them, even in different faiths. This positive interaction through cyberspace is marvelous. I can simply say a few examples through my, my own experience. Uh, I have a teenage son who is a student in a grammar stream. He's a, he's a very sociable child who enjoys being with children's company. He, particip he participates meditation and learning Buddhist practice from Dham Dhampasala. Dhampasala is a, is a place uh, running from temples. It's like a school, uh, but teaching Dhamma, teaching Buddhist, um, Buddhist culture and Buddhist uh, philosophy. And he participates to meditation groups. Both meditation groups are remote. One is from our very honorable monk from USA. And the other one is from our dedicated brothers who love, he loves attending passionately. I was just wondering that how he thought and felt about how he used these things in his life. Then I ask, um, Puta, how do you feel about that Buddhist way of life helped you in this COVID situation? He said, Amma, COVID time was a boredom but I carried on doing this meditation and mindfulness to be focused. I was not depressed and understanding the reality of life. According to the truth of life, birth, aging, sickness, and death considered to be an inevitable um, reality. So that uh, we human beings must endure and in. But when we, when we are living, we must do good deeds to help others and mainly help myself to be focused and understand to be mindful. Really, that is the main thing in our lifestyle. I never feel boredom. I can be happy every minute of life and makes others feel happy with being mindful. I can be happy every minute. It really is, quietly I thought, that may be enough to express what our faith has done to, my, to, to help my child. It gives the indication of how faith helps the next generation. And this directly has done by participating in it. Most Dhamma schools were conducted from homes through temples to keep children's activities and mindful crafts. So this is, as, uh, as in education, I think it is important that uh, living in the present moment and understanding the truth of life, that, that reality has taught from the, from the temples, from, from faith-based uh, faith organizations. Also, um, this is also uh, my personal experience talking to a friend of mine who is a GP and a Buddhist. She explained that how many people become, how many people come to get support for mental health issues after COVID as they cannot accept the reality and the truth of life. Sickness can come to life anytime and can accept the death. 
but this does not appeal much to i think as what she says as well to buddhist community as as such because it is a kind of understanding quite easily understanding um it is my personal view anyway from faith communities together played a huge role in facilitating communities raising awareness to raise awareness of understanding oneself and and help understanding about other occupants in the household this is also very important most of the faith based organizations have done a lot of help to develop this mental health issues during this time most families family members live in house 24/7 that can be hard so to protect domestic abuse and preventing homelessness ending up one person leaving the house that understanding the facilitation given to the families to help understanding each other um raising understanding each other's mind and the space there are few there, i think there were few programs continuously happening from the buddhist community support here in the uk and also i think no one felt or no one feels overwhelmed uh, as they as and as then when they they could leave the program even without interrupting and adjusting to each other or any other people's needs at most of them at as most of the these programs were online so there were projects done and led by uh, buddhist communities buddhist temples in the uk to give donations to homeless people as uh, dry as dry ration parcels and also um cooked food some councils cooked food together online just they were connecting each other online and distributed to shelters and homeless house um, homeless people's houses like the 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 places this was fascinating as i heard that um, one uh, the, uh, one incident uh, like faith leaders from every faith uh, from every kind of faith leaders got together on zoom and they cooked their food just together um on a screen and then they 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 just delivered that food to shelters how beautiful that it is the connection of uh, faith leaders and also there were programs they did um we uh, participated as youth youth got together for cooking events and they made donations to and really actually people generously helped each other as social projects the, the 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 important thing is actually they use this beautiful community gatherings on zoom and did these projects and delivered and also individually who uh, who who, um, who was in infected if affected affected by corona covid um, all the neighbors it's no matter what what religion or what faith or anything but they did help each other with uh, food shopping i remember in our community somebody put the put a little note with uh, with their telephone numbers anyone wants to collect food from um, super stores or um, supermarkets Uh, please call that they would like to go and get it and deliver it to your door things like the simple helps were massive this i think and also i think um, some of the projects they the um, the projects used like elderly skillful people as managers accountants chefs and all administrators and all and they just used that uh, as volunteers to their projects and it empowered that elderly community sharing their skills and let them feel like as a part of a chain to support each other so they contributed something bigger than them 
this is just i think um i always think that when we when when these projects were conducted faith is one bonded bonded people as one faith being a buddhist actually i personally enjoy every minute of life doing something good to help others and helping myself to be happy and content when i trapped in house i took i just did few projects to keep myself busy because i i am disabled and i'm quite housebound so i just um, can't move much so then i i used to take a photograph every day every sunset every evening and wrote a poem or something just uh, to awaken myself so i was thankful to the mother nature who really purified herself during this covid period less fuel burning and less pollution and we, it made us hear birds singing showing colors of flowers and leaves all these these little beauties to survive in hard times of covid i think as an as an educator i want to give a little message to the entire world as uh, it says uh, in my calendar back behind me each morning we born again we do what we do today matters the most that was what lord buddha said so live live in the present moment that is what i want to pass this message as a um as an educator rather than i could say a, a faith leader but and educate as an educator i could uh, pass that message thank you very much for listening to me thank you very much indeed uh, sudarma for enlightening us uh, on how a family living away from their home country really perceived about the hope believes and trust and help during the covid-19 pandemic so uh let me invite the second speaker calling it to the silva he is a professor emeritus at the university of peradeniya where he served the department of sociology and the faculty of arts in various capacities for almost 40 years currently he is the chief editor of the sri lanka journal of social science published by national science foundation and uh, he's a author of uh, many articles and book one of the most important one is the decolonization development and disease a socialist of malaria in sri lanka that published in 2014 so uh, with this strength i would like to hand over these to uh, kalinga to desilla it's over to you thank you okay so uh, actually this is uh, one of the recent studies that uh, i have been associated with it looks at uh, the impact of covid-19 on peace building activities of local faith actors uh, this was a study uh, funded by uh, uk uh, arts and humanities council uh, funded through uh, world vision um, and university of leeds uh, so in uh, and then also i will uh, draw from a study that we did for sarvo there uh, looking at uh, social determinants of the pandemic uh, in both these studies uh, we followed the kind of similar methodology uh first we uh, did key informant interviews using uh, mobile devices uh, because during the pandemic you can't meet uh, people physically and secondly we conducted uh, online surveys so i will uh, try to share some of the findings of these surveys uh, with you uh, to give a bit of a uh, account of the landscape of religion in sri lanka there are four world religions in sri lanka buddhism of course is the uh, 
the most widely practiced religion. Uh, 70% of the people uh, you know, are Buddhist. Um, and then we have 13% of uh, people who are Hindus, about 10% Islam um, and 7% Christianity. So these are all uh, kind of world religions. Um, and Sri Lanka has a kind of has had a history of peaceful coexistence among religions over the years. Um, and of course, there were some dynastic wars and some tension from time to time. But uh, for the most part, there has been a peaceful uh, coexistence and exchange among different religions. So much so actually Buddhism practice in Sri Lanka has also incorporated uh, quite a few Hindu uh, deities um, in this religion. So we call it religious syncretism um, when we talk about uh, the Sri Lankan uh, situation. But in recent times, there has been a buildup of tension uh, among religions, uh, initially in the colonial period, but continued on uh, to the post-colonial era and even on to uh, the pandemic. Uh, just to give a quick uh, introduction about faith-based organizations in Sri Lanka, there are a large number of uh, faith-based organizations. I broadly define uh, FBOs as organizations that tap uh, religious sentiments and resources for advancing human welfare in whatever way, way they do. Uh, so we have national level religiously um, inspired organizations like YMCA, YWCA, uh, uh, you know, uh, and YMBA, YMMA, all Ceylon Buddhist Congress. Um, and also we have a large number of religiously inspired uh, NGOs, including Caritas International, World Vision Lanka, Islamic Relief. Uh, I will not talk specifically about Sarvode here. Uh, I, I'm not 100% sure whether Sarvode comes under uh, the strict uh, definition of FBO, but I will leave it to Dr. Vinayar Um, And then there are also organizational arms of village level uh, religious organizations like Daika Sabhas connected with uh, Buddhist temples, Mahila Samitis, uh, Mosque Federations, church organizations, and a whole range of uh, uh, village level institutions. There are also interfaith networks and also more importantly, during the pandemic, we also found there were individual faith actors operating on their own, raising funds um, and, and trying to help people who are in trouble. Uh, I will not speak uh, a great deal about the state uh, relation to FBOs. Actually, it's difficult to describe it in one word or even one sentence. But I would say it's a kind of ambivalent relationship, uh, particularly uh, under the current uh, regime. Uh, of course, this regime uh, was elected largely through the support of Buddhist monks. They played a very important role uh, in uh, this uh, election, election and uh, getting this uh, uh, party elected in the uh, uh, last election in 2019. Um, but uh, at the same time, it has the state has had a fairly ambivalent relationship with uh, especially minority religions. One example of that was uh, mandatory cremation of COVID dead uh, imposed uh, early on. Um, and then, you know, the, this actually uh, hurt the Muslim community who consider uh, burial, you know, uh, part of their religious right and also in keeping with their religious faith. So this led to some kind of uh, tension. Uh, and also there were some uh, Muslim organizations banned uh, following the Easter attack. I think there are eight or nine of them. Uh, so that also created some kind of tension. Uh, also I had to mention that there is no faith uh, or even civil society represented in many of the decision-making bodies. Uh, such as the presidential task force appointed to uh, uh, you know, coordinate uh, COVID-related work. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, 
you know, government also invited religious organizations to come to uh, its help, particularly during the pandemic when uh, some children's homes, elderly homes uh, were without food um, and invited uh, some organizations to come forward. Forward. So this is a kind of uh, ambivalent uh, relationship. Uh, but, but also I must mention at the village level, uh, several government officers actually invited faith actors to come to their help, particularly when they, when they had problems about uh, hesitancy, vaccine hesitancy among some minority communities. And I will talk about, about it a bit later. So uh, the religious experiences uh, that I'm going to talk about are largely autonomous, uh, you know, initiated by religious actors out of faith. Uh, religious motivations were important. Uh, so they, there were donations um, used for um, conducting a fairly extensive uh, humanitarian assistance program during the pandemic, uh, uh, also using some online platforms for fundraising. So um, let me try to summarize some of the key areas where uh, FBOs are involved uh, in the pandemic response. The first one I already referred to, relief and humanitarian assistance uh, during the pandemic because many people lost their livelihoods um, and they could not uh, buy food. Uh, and then of course, lockdown also contributed to that. So in that situation, many, religious organizations came forward to assist. Then uh, health education also was important uh, function of some uh, faith-based organizations and civil society actors. And uh, FBOs also played a role in counseling services, trust building, um, also countering hate speech. Um, I think like in many other countries, Sri Lanka also had a kind of pandemic of hate uh, primarily targeting minority communities and minority religions. And some FBOs came forward to actually counter that. Um, and also basically connecting, uh, create, step, you know, uh, co establishing connectivity during the pandemic through virtual platforms. Um, I don't think I have time to go into all of those in great detail, uh, but let me uh, touch on uh, some of this uh, in somewhat more detail. Uh, Faith-based organizations were involved in uh, distribution of dry food um, and cash among the affected populations. Uh, and also some organizations were involved in uh, distribution of hygienic devices uh, like masks, sanitizers uh, among the public and also personal protection equipment for health workers and the public. Uh, and also they contributed to uh, supply uh, the needed equipment to some government hospitals, uh, which did not have enough funds to buy some of this equipment. And also some organizations played an important role in promotion of herbal remedies. But one of the most important points I want to mention in this presentation is the trans-faith character of humanitarian assistance. Many religious organizations uh, not only try to support, provide relief to members of their own communities, but open up these services for all the communities. Uh, and they did it deliberately, far more than in previous uh, you know, disasters. Of course, uh, this was a feature in previous disasters as well, but I think this was far more significant in the pandemic. Uh, so this is something that I think uh, perhaps contributed to uh, promotion of hope and also mutual understanding among communities. Uh, humanitarian assistance was uh, inspired by religious ideas in each religion, like for instance, Dana in Buddhism, Sakat and Sadaka uh, in, in Islam, uh, and Dhanam in Hinduism, and of course, several forms of charity uh, in Christianity. Um, and uh, so using these religious ideas, many FPOs actually raise funds uh, and encourage people to help each other uh, uh, and, and develop uh, faith-based uh, social networks as well. I, I have listed some of them here. Uh, and also I must mention that uh, not only uh, humanitarian assistance was distributed uh, trans-faith, but also fundraising was largely trans-faith. 
Uh, so the religious Buddhist monks, for instance, would approach, uh, you know, like Muslim traders uh, to raise funds uh, and, and they complied. Uh, so this was also a very important feature of this pandemic. Here I have some pictures of uh, relief services which were transferred, um, you know, like um, monks and Christian fathers getting together. At the bottom, you have a picture of a Buddhist monk actually who single-handedly uh, had his own, um, you know, like um, uh, dry food uh, distribution here. You can see him carrying actually a lot of vegetables. The Buddhist monks are not supposed to uh, do this kind of thing, but he said, this is a time we are at a disaster and, and the temples should actually try to distribute whatever resources they have. For instance, they said, you know, he said, uh, uh, you know, that money collected in donation boxes um, have to be distributed among people uh, and, and we, should, we should feed them um, at this difficult time. Uh, this, in, in our online survey, we also uh, found, asked people how many of them actually contributed uh, to relief work? Um, about 60% uh, said they did. Uh, so this was a fairly significant number. Health education and promotion work, I think also uh, involved uh, FBOs in a big way. Uh, vaccine up uptake was very important, particularly uh, in Eastern Sri Lanka. Um, they, there were also quarantine services provided by uh, uh, some faith-based organizations and uh, also big campaign for awareness raising about COVID-19 and its prevention. I think Sarode movement played a major role there. Uh, with regard to vaccine uh, hesitancy in Eastern Sri Lanka, early on when uh, vaccines were introduced uh, in, in 2021, uh, you know, some people in Eastern Sri Lanka, particularly Muslims, Hindus and Christians were reluctant to um, accept vaccines. Uh, for instance, you know, there were many places where vaccines were available and people were not coming forward. So at this time, actually religious uh, actors, uh, especially faith leaders from different religions, you know, they carried out a lot of activities to, uh, you know, counter misinformation, fake news, um, and, and also promote uh, uh, vaccine uh, uptake uh, among their members. Uh, this is uh, in our survey, we asked them, ask people, you know, uh, how far they agree with, um, I trust the vaccination program. Uh, qu quite a large number said they do agree uh, or strongly agree. Uh, but there were also significant numbers of people who are not sure and who also even disagreed or strongly disagreed. Uh, so obviously there were some uh, kind of uh, misunderstanding about the pandemic, about the vaccines. And in this situation, many religious leaders, Maulavis, Christian priests, Hindu priests came forward to popularize uh, vaccines. They went around in vehicles announcing in loudspeakers uh, that uh, you know uh, everybody should take vaccines quickly. Some local mosques, mosques actually countered misinformation and advised devotees over the Juma prayers to go for vaccination. And also Muslim Doctors Forum came forward um, to, to um, actually counter this misinformation as well. So this has a big impact in uh, terms of uh, promoting vaccine up uptake. Trust building is also important. Um, I think uh, uh, there were several important developments in Buddhism during this period that we should uh, pay attention to. Uh, one was um, this merger of uh, two uh, Buddhist uh, sects, Amarapura and Ramanya, uh, to form um, what is called uh, United Sangha Sabha, uh, United Amarapura Ramanya Sangha Sabha. And actually, uh, they uh, had uh, many campaigns, but one was to support the interfaith campaign of the burial right of Muslims. when. Uh, Many of the Buddhist monks, actually popular Buddhist monks, said, no, we should only have cremation for everybody, one country, one law kind of argument. But it is at this time, this organization came forward and they actually, this is a copy of a petition, they appeal they made to the president of Sri Lanka, signed by uh, the two 
representatives of uh, these two organizations. And I should also mention a little bit about uh, some religious developments. This is actually uh, a group uh, led by uh, Reverend Galkande uh, Dhammananda. Uh, he uh, had uh, many TV programs and also YouTube presentations about how about a possible Buddhist approach to uh, uh, the pandemic. Uh, now, let me uh, try to summarize some of his ideas. He criticized the effort to produce so-called miracle cures um, from within Buddhist tradition. Uh, and he said, Buddhism has the idea of healing. Uh, he, and he said, uh, healing has two components, healing the mind and healing the body. So Buddhist ideas, especially uh, like what uh, Sudharma was mentioning earlier, sati, mindfulness, I think was one of his key messages. Um, and also he tried to promote compassion and empathy towards the religious other, especially in his uh, you know, religious uh, uh, sermons to Buddhist devotees. He did mention just, just as much as you love your dead uh, and, and you love your family members, um, Muslim people too. So they should be allowed to uh, bury their, uh, you know, uh, COVID dead uh, as they wish. Uh, so this, this was, it was very important that it came from a Buddhist monk at that time. And probably that also contributed to change of mind um, and, and reintroduction of burial later on. Countering hate speech also, there were, there were quite a lot of hate speech uh, during the first wave of the pandemic. I am, I am I'm showing you a couple of them. Um, the first one says, uh, uh, this, uh, this is about COVID, uh, made in China, uh, brand name Corona, and uh, distributor in Sri Lanka is Nana. Nana is a kind of slang word for Muslims among Sinhalese. So it's a kind of, uh, you know, basically uh, trying to uh, argue that uh, uh, the disease actually came from uh, Muslims and and this other uh, slide, other uh, you know you, uh, post also indicates you know in uh, 2019 there was Easter attack by Muslims and in 2020 uh, Muslims came forward to uh, with the virus uh, to uh, infect other communities. So this kind of hate speech was quite common, but there were several organizations uh, which uh, conducted. Uh, uh, programs to counter this kind of hate speech. One is National Christian Evangelical Alliance of Sri Lanka, uh, which, can, which carried out uh, uh, awareness raising about uh, uh, digital media. They called it uh, Digital Citizenship Toolkit, uh, which involved comic books, digital games, uh, popularized through their website, Minor Matters. Uh, and toolkit uh, was used for training of youth and religious actors. Um, you know, for responsible use of uh, uh, social media. Uh, and I, I think that campaign uh, had a fairly big impact. This is their reach uh, in, in the initial period. Um, so, uh, and also impact of the pandemic on religious faith. Uh, uh, I want to share with you some uh, of our findings of our online survey. Um, one of the questions we asked, uh, uh, in this survey was, uh, how did the pandemic affect your faith? Uh, the green bar indicates enhanced faith, red indicates no change, and the blue is uh, decreased faith. As you can see, most people uh, reported, uh, you know, the, the, during the pandemic, actually uh, the faith was enhanced, uh, maybe because, uh, because of the risks involved, uh, risk of infection, uh, risk of death, uh, and most people were actually uh, made closer uh, to religious institutions and religious faith uh, during this pandemic. And this is how it varies among different religions. As you can see, uh, Islam and uh, uh, two Christian groups uh, actually had a more people saying that the faith increased. Uh, among Buddhists and Hindus, it was less, but nevertheless, significant numbers uh, even among Buddhists and Hindus said that their faith uh, increased uh, during the pandemic. Uh, this is, uh, we also carried out a study on uh, the use of uh, 
religious remedies uh, and protective devices during COVID-19 pandemic. This is actually in our Sarvodhya survey. Um, the first uh, chart indicates uh, Pirith. I think uh, also this is referred to by Sudharma. Pirith uh, was, you know, there were many government initiated programs of Pirith chanting, but also local people initiated. Um, you can see that uh, large number actually uh, either often or always uh, use uh, Pirith and also meditation, I think, uh, yeah, meditation. Uh, so this is significant that it shows that people actually resorted to uh, not only religious faith, but also religious practices. Uh, finally, in terms of conclusion, uh, so what, what, what we found in this study is that, um, you know, the, the situation uh, in Sri Lanka in regard to the role of faith-based organizations changed over the three pandemic waves. Uh, in the first pandemic wave, uh, perhaps there was a great deal of mistrust and most of the, uh, you know, hate speech actually came uh, forward in that period. Um, uh, and uh, uh, but but by the third uh, wave, uh, interfaith collaboration actually came forward uh, because people realized that this is not a uh, you know like a disaster encountered by only one religion. Um, everybody was at equal risk, uh, so that idea came, and with that also mutual health became very important. Religious actors. Uh, help uh, overcome hesitancy in minority communities in particular, uh, as I already told you, faith as an important aspect of pandemic response and building hope um, and, and interfaith engagements from within majority and minority religions and also different religions coming together. And also the final point is that there is a kind of, in spite of all the religious tension, uh, that uh, escalated uh, in recent times. There is a reservoir of uh, religious sentiments for promoting trust, empathy, and mutual understanding in Sri Lanka. I think with that, I will wind up. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Tudor. It's a very nice presentation. I think uh, it has taken this similar to another arena, how we, Sri Lanka managed the faith and even the beliefs along with the hate speech. So it's a good topic we can discuss during the Q&A session. The next panelist or presenter would be Dr. Vina S. Aryaratna. He's the president of the Sarodhya Shramadana movement, which is the Sri Lanka's largest non-governmental organization, grassroots development organization. A part of that, he is a specialist in community medicine and the past president of College of Community Physicians of Sri Lanka. Uh, along with his uh, affiliation and education and qualification, I would like to give you some uh, description about his uh, involvement at the moment. Uh, he has since experience in public health, community and development, disaster management, nutrition, and child health, and working with war affected communities and internal displayed persons. Currently, he's uh, really he involved with uh, COVID-19 prevention and control work in Sri Lanka and serves as a co-chair of the United Nations Humanitarian Country Team, HCT, Health Cluster. Uh, Furthermore, Dr. Ari Ratna is a member of independent expert group converted by the WHO for COVID-19 response in Sri Lanka. Finally, he is the president-elect of Sri Lanka Medical Association, SLMA. Out of his CV, I'd like to mention that uh, when I was a medical student, at the Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sri Jarzumba, Sri Lanka. If I'm not wrong, Dr. Vinaya was a lecturer over there. So it's over to you, Dr. Vinaya. Thank you, Suranga. And it's a great pleasure to uh, 
participate in this panel uh, discussion moderated by you. Of course, I remember you very well. So I was a lecturer in community medicine at the University of Rajawadhanapura uh, when you were a student. So great pleasure and uh, good evening to everyone. And uh, I will uh, share my uh, thoughts on the role of uh, faith in sustaining hope. Uh, reflection from Sri Lanka because uh, the, the theme was actually focused around uh, hope. So I thought I would relate to the um, series of discussions which is centered around uh, hope. So um, with this, I will cover the uh, just uh, overview of the impact, then the response uh, from the state to other, other uh, actors and hope. Uh, what does it really mean? And then the role of faith-based uh, or faith-inspired organizations and uh, the response uh, as uh, also been uh, described by Professor Tudor, the three waves of course had a different uh, uh, impact um, and also the response was somewhat uh, different. So then finally I'll touch on the uh, faith inspired response from Sarvodaya, the organization that I represent. So in terms of numbers, we all know that Sri Lanka has uh, so far had uh, more than 600,000 uh, reported cases, but the actual number may be quite uh, uh, larger than this. Then also we have had uh, uh, 15,492 deaths so far. So I'd like to start uh, by just uh, reflecting on this uh, term hope. Uh, we, you know, we use the term hope. Uh, it's an anticipation of a better outcome, you know, something that will give us solace or relief in the future. Uh, but to lay people, you know, and also to different communities, it has different connotations. Uh, a minority ethnic group may uh, interpret hope in a different way because they may uh, not have had hope uh, even before the pandemic. And also a different religious group may uh, look at uh, hope in a, another way. Then socioeconomic group, particularly uh, you, you look at, uh, you know, uh, people who belong to the lower socioeconomic strata. Uh, they, they may perceive uh, hope in a different way. They may see hope only by leaving the country. Uh, and if you look at youth, it may also be the same. So it, it, it's a, a broad range of expectations when it comes to the hope. So in that context, what's the religious or faith uh, perspective? So I like to um, reflect on this based on the experience of the Sarvode movement, which is a civil society organization. Uh, so here, uh, you know, we have already seen the diversity that is there in Sri Lanka in terms of religious composition. So uh, in terms of the numbers, we have a, a, a greater number of Buddhists in Sri Lanka, followed by Hindu, Islam, and Christian population. So uh, I would like to first present to you a, a study that we did at the very early stages of the uh, pandemic during the first wave that was uh, in 2020, around May to June. So I'm going to present just a few slides on the uh, on the outcome uh, of this study. So the purpose of this study uh, was to survey uh, the understanding uh, and the experiences and challenges uh, to identify a way forward and to meaningfully support, engage the followers and mobilize communities to ensure well-being of children. This was uh, focused on uh, children. Uh, and um, uh, so, um, we started with uh, data collections, uh, um, uh, which were to be uh, <clears throat> conducted uh, uh, online because we couldn't do it uh, uh, in person. Um, and the coverage was all island, all 25 districts, and we had about uh, 2,470 respondents. So uh, we started with assessing the overall level of engagement of the faith leaders themselves. Now, this was important because everybody assumed that they were fine and they were very well looked after. Their institutions were strong and, you know, uh, they didn't themselves need any support. It was the people who were the followers and the communities needed their support, which wasn't really the case. So um, uh, first we asked, how did you engage with your followers? Was it at a, at a minimum level or moderate level? Majority uh, was uh, at a uh, mid -le moderate level. That is, uh, 
uh, when you rank low level, high level, and moderate level engagement, uh, an overwhelming uh, majority, 40%, had a moderate level of engagement, whereas also about one third had low level of engagement. Of course, we had defined uh, the engagement in a certain way, which I'll not go into detail. Then, uh, when you look at the, the, mod, the moderate level of engagement, within that you see a, a, a certain variation, not very significant. So that means all religions uh, here, uh, I think uh, the, the Islam is not uh, mentioned here, but uh, uh, the highest level of uh, engagement uh, was actually uh, also noticed in Islam and there was also regional or district wise variations. Uh, so the low level of engagement was seen in some southern districts uh, in, in Sri Lanka. So the impact, we looked at the impact for the religious leaders. Most uh, uh, reported that the most significant impact of the imposition of the curfew on religious institutions, places of worship, has been the halt of regular religious sermons. That affected them very much. Then uh, how to keep the premises maintained, because usually the followers come in, help them to maintain their places of worship. And also uh, their arms, uh, you know, the, the donations also uh, decreased significantly. So we have identified certain temples also where the Buddhist monks didn't receive their regular arms or, or dana. And the response that they had been uh, giving to their followers, of course, was centered around advice and counseling uh, to their respective followers. And also, as it was mentioned by Professor Huda Silva and uh, also the previous speaker, the uh, distribution of ration uh, packs, you know, dry rations, and also uh, sharing risk education through social media and financial aid for uh, humanitarian efforts. So they played their traditional role of being humanitarians. Uh, then about a certain minority could not afford to support the other communities uh, significantly. And also we have uh, seen uh, that uh, there was variation between the different types of religious, uh, religious leaders uh, as well. So uh, when, they, when you asked what were the methods of engagement with your communities, most of them, as mentioned earlier also, they had the online uh, platforms, but it was, they had uh, significant limitations uh, because uh, some did not have uh, connectivity. Then if you look at uh, the uh, social media applications, again, uh, quite a, a, a large number used social media for, for communication. Then also they had the online sermons, live streams and webinars uh, have the low, uh, but they were lowest percentage across all religious groups. Now I'm talking about uh, the, the, this, this uh, events happening uh, during the first lockdown, after the, during the first wave, uh, wave. So the online sermon was very low at that time. Now, of course, it, it's a different story. And uh, access, their main access was to a landline or a basic mobile phone compared to uh, the uh, other, other means such as uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, internet uh, access through a computer, laptop or a desktop was very minimal. So digital devices, again, you could see a variation is a, a, a land phone uh, or a basic mobile phone was what they are, they are main uh, means of communication with their followers. So then when we asked them what were their main, main uh, uh, challenges during the pandemic to engage now to keep this hope alive amongst the people. So uh, they are inability to conduct usual religious ceremonies and special religious occasions, which generally happens in person. So they are not used to uh, this virt virtual space to engage with the followers. And also, as mentioned earlier, lack of access to uh, communication technology, protective hygiene material, limited financial assistance, limited uh, access to other forms of communication technology. So that they, they, they required certain support. Uh, mainly they were asking for technological equipment uh, support uh, and also to uh, for financial resources to conduct humanitarian efforts and so on. I'll not go into details here because I like to uh, get to the uh, main um, uh, topic, but they also required training 
and we provided training. We were one of the first organizations to provide the religious leaders with training on how to use the safe and responsible use of social media as well. So they were uh, uh, also observing and we could see it now very clearly through other statistics, poverty levels have increased. In Sri Lanka, more than 500,000 people uh, came to the, uh, uh, were again classified as uh, new poor in Sri Lanka because they fell below the poverty line. And there was a lot of psychological distress uh, and this was quite significant. And uh, so we were uh, definitely uh, seeing uh, these uh, psychological disorders happening uh, in higher uh, frequency. And also as uh, earlier mentioned by uh, Sudharma, the religious leaders were trying to help and also the in increased violence against children, gender-based violence as well as violence against children was increasing. So we were trying to mobilize the religious leaders to address these challenges. So uh, I think in the future, uh, we will, uh, this uh, situation will get worsened, particularly with the food crisis that we are um, uh, having. So the religious leaders and the faith-based organizations were trying to address this distress and these family issues uh, within the resources that they had. So increase uh, also in the ethnic tension happened as uh, described by Professor Tude earlier. Uh, and this uh, was very significant. And later, of course, due to various interventions, both by the civil society organizations and by religious leaders themselves, uh, this was to a great extent mitigated. So the districts also, there were uh, variations, particularly if you take a district like Gampaha, which is in the Western province, there was very high incidence of increased violence against children, both uh, domestic violence and also online violence because they had uh, access uh, uh, by that time uh, for school uh, work and all that. Uh, so, um, and uh, lowest uh, incidence was felt in uh, candy. Of course, this was probably the sample size wasn't uh, that enough, but it gives a very valid uh, uh, sample to uh, draw some broad conclusions. Then adjusting to the new normal, then that was also a challenge for them. Uh, then they wanted to, <clears throat> uh, when the curfew was lifted, they wanted to restart and they had to prepare their places of worship. That was a challenge because how to get access to this uh, hand washing facilities and so on. So uh, we also assisted them uh, to have those <clears throat> facilities, including online facilities uh, for engaging with their followers. Then uh, the recommendations were based on this study and we tried our best to raise awareness among the religious leaders about COVID-19 and the precautionary measures and extended this training uh, support and also uh, incentivizing the religious and faith leaders to engage through on online platforms uh, by sometimes providing uh, uh, like uh, paying uh, the, the, uh, the data uh, giving a data elements uh, through certain programs. And also we have to devise a national plan to support religious premises, maintenance and other basic needs during a lockdown. That was a lesson that was uh, learned. Then provide them with hygiene material, which we did to a great extent during the uh, second and third uh, lockdowns. So coming back to the present situation, we are now in the third wave and um, it's still continuing uh, as at 31st, uh, December 2021, we have had 14,000 deaths. That is eight, within eight months, we had 14,000 people dying. And uh, there were elderly people. At the same time, there were younger people, those who are below 60 uh, years of age. So that's a significant uh, number. And you can imagine the plight. So how to build hope in the families who have lost their loved ones, who have lost their uh, breadwinner, so these are the problems that we have to uh, uh, we have to uh, address. Again, we are seeing a rise in cases. Last two three days, we have had more than thousand cases reported. Although the testing uh, also is decreased now, therefore we believe that the actual numbers are at least two times more than what is reported. So the 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 the, uh, the challenges have not ended. So we have to keep evolving. Uh, the nature of challenges are, are, are changing from the first wave, as you can see, uh, 
the numbers were less. Second wave, of course, more numbers. Now third wave uh, continues. So our response has been as a faith-inspired organization. We are not a faith-based organization, but faith-inspired organization. We uh, developed a five-pronged approach. We contribute to the national response. We make uh, COVID-ready communities by community through a community empowerment. We provide emergency relief in the form of dry rations and other assistance. Then trying to uh, help uh, organizations to be COVID-ready. Then finally, so, uh, in socioeconomic recovery. So in this whole uh, integrated approach, we try to build hope and sustain hope. So we started by actually using the texts of the religious texts themselves, religious teachings as uh, appropriate to give the COVID-19 preventive messages. So uh, firstly, we were also immediately trying to address the stigma associated with, uh, with COVID-19. So we used the Hindu texts, Buddhist texts, and also Christian texts uh, and, and Islamic texts. So this, these were very, very innovative and were very well, of course, we, we went through a process to, uh, to, to uh, um, identify the correct messaging because it's very sensitive. You can't give a wrong message. So then we also developed material for community preparedness, uh, having these manuals where we also uh, were uh, related to the religious leaders, how to get their support in organizing the communities and also building a resilient community and a kind of a COVID ready community, how to even support the families who are on quarantine and how to look after children. And when there, are, there is dismemberment of a family, then how do you address those problems? Then uh, the vaccine hesitancy, we are uh, really <clears throat> getting the support of your religious leaders to address uh, some of the, the, the issues related to vaccination and also giving uh, messages and we collaborate with the uh, health ministry and UNICEF and so on. So this is where we are now and uh, we uh, wish to continue our engagement with uh, religious leaders and I think uh, we are much better prepared today. Uh, at the same time, the challenges are also greater, but I think uh, we can continue to sustain hope and religious leaders, faith-based organizations, faith-inspired organizations all play a very important role. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vinyar Ratna, for making that long presentation in very nutshell. So we have really nearly 15 minutes for the discussion now. Uh, I will uh, start the forum and uh, I have uh, uh, one question and uh, really based on uh, Dr. Ari Ratna's last slide also, as well as uh, two other presenters also really mentioned about this. The, the, that is the messaging. Now, I can really feel, and there are some literature over there in terms of messaging, uh, came from the top to down, or from the Ministry of Health or some or health organization or faith-based organization from these societies, as well as messages between societies and, and within the society. So, uh, for instance, if you get uh, uh, messages from the main, one of the main messages in, uh, in the UK, it's save the National Health Service. Whereas uh, there are some incidents, uh, especially in Sri Lanka, messages are really based on uh, making fear psychosis among the individuals, families, and societies. For instance, uh, it has those messages has really hyped or really enhanced the the severe repercussion of COVID nineteen and even the severe complication about about the the illness as well as the the issues of uh, quarantine and uh, the my question is how did those type of messages affect the especially the uh, the stigma about the disease and how did the faith and beliefs really work on this type of messaging over the individuals i think dr vinya would uh, answer first and any uh, anyone in this uh, uh, in this forum i think uh, they can answer later on 
Uh, I'll, thank you, uh, Surang. I'll try. Uh, actually, I don't uh, know whether there was like in the initial phase, the fear psychosis, but the stigma was definitely there. But uh, I think the Health Educ health uh, Promotion Bureau was the first to come up with the, the messaging. And they were done very well. Actually, it was uh, not arousing fear through the messaging. Anyway, there was a lot of fear generally because through media, media, you know, general media was showing all the, you know, visuals about people dying and all that. So that, that automatically created the fear psychosis and also because of that people, you know, of course there was a lockdown and they didn't go out. But I must say the, the, the actual campaign against say like burials came from a different ethno, ethno-religious uh, you know, ideological and political uh, base, uh, not not really from any other other quarters in Sri Lanka. So that was uh, very early on detected, and those who were quite responsible made appeals based on science. But uh, unfortunately, government didn't uh, listen to that. They gave into the more sort of uh, religiously biased, uh, uh, in uh, you know, uh, views. So even uh, the uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association uh, made uh, uh, a very objective assessment and recommended that, you know, uh, it, it's not compulsory to uh, cremate all the, uh, uh, you know, dead of uh, COVID. So, but that wasn't followed. But later, I think uh, there was uh, quite well, very well, uh, very responsible uh, messaging. But even to date, uh, for example, the, the booster vaccine, uh, this misinformation uh, is spreading and it's very difficult to counter. So infodemic, as we call it, is uh, still there. Thank you. Uh, uh, Anab, do you have any other questions from the forum or otherwise I have another question? All right. Uh, this is to really uh, Tudor, I think. Uh, during the hype of the pandemic, I saw that even uh, there's a huge uh, calamity in Sri Lanka in terms of the getting vaccines. And then, uh, during this period, I think, or before that, there were some herbal medicine was came in. Uh, those, there were some herbal medicines uh, and that was really promoted by the, even for the government uh, uh, from the government as well. So what do you think that how people uh, accept those type of uh, uh, those type of uh, herbal medicine or, or maybe some medicine not in, in the herbal in nature. So how uh, individuals and societies really uh, respond to this type of uh, medicine? So Ranga, that's a very uh interesting question and uh, i think uh, you know it's uh, first we have to understand that you know we have a we have a culture or health culture influenced by uh, what we call plural medicine you know western medicine is of course widely accepted uh, but it doesn't mean that people have completely given up their you know ayurvedic ideas about body humors um, and things like that. So most people actually, including doctors, uh, you know, they they tend to um, be kind of uh, uh, pluralistic uh, in their uh, health behavior. And uh, also with regard to, uh, you know, this question about herbal medicines, of course, you know, it was, it was over-politicized. And, uh, you know, this uh, one or two, uh, so-called uh, miracle uh, cures uh, came up uh, partly because uh, of, you know, they, they didn't have any kind of foundation in uh, traditional medicine. Uh, you know, they were completely uh, new inventions, uh, you know, made by people out of self-interest. Uh, so they, you know, obviously uh, got uh, the backing of uh, certain leaders uh, and certain parties, and that that's how they became popular. But very very quickly, this faith uh, declined. You know, this faith in these uh, miracle uh, medicines. But it doesn't mean that you know these other 
for instance, there is a great deal of demand on, uh, you know, uh, colocander uh, and uh, this uh, decongestants using herbal medicines, um, and they pro probably provide some relief. Uh, so, uh, so that we have to recognize, and I think, uh, you know, people have a, uh, if they think that it gives them relief, uh, why not? Uh, but what is wrong is like what uh, Dr. Vinya was saying, that there were also certain scientists, you know, who actually um, inspired more by uh, their nationalistic uh, feelings than by science. Uh, actually, one observer has uh, referred to them as uh, patriotic scientists, so so-called patriotic scientists, you know, they are actually not, uh, they, they are not practicing science, but they are using science to popularize certain um, uh, remedies which have not received uh, you know, enough uh, validity. So I think we have to look at it in, uh, in those terms. And uh, uh, personally, I feel that people should have the option to uh, you know, adopt relief measures, uh, you know, whatever they think is uh, right. Um, but you know, like uh, discouraging, like for instance, vaccine use, uh, you know, for certain uh, ideological reasons, I think that's that is what is problematic. So we have to find the right balance, I think, in this. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tude. So uh, I don't know if the Sudharma is online at the moment. Anyway, uh, meantime, uh, I, I have got another uh, question uh, regarding uh, the COVID management and uh, uh, the, uh, the support received from Sri Lanka from other international organizations, especially UN organizations. Uh, so Dr. Ari Ratna now, uh, it's a fact that uh, Sri Lanka was really managing uh, COVID uh, in terms of uh, uh, applying with uh, various type of uh, vaccines. Now, uh, currently, uh, the booster dose he has been uh, taken by uh, a much less number of people as ex than expected. So uh, uh, during this time, uh, I think, uh, we have enough vaccine at the moment, but previously, uh, at the beginning of uh, vaccine distribution, Sri Lanka faced immense problem in terms of vaccine uh, uh, shortage. So, would we be able to really uh, uh, match these uh, issues at, uh, since uh, the supply was really depend on the uh, international suppliers and even uh, Sri Lankan economic situation? as well as the, the receiver's faith and the beliefs and the attitudes over those vaccines. So uh, during that time, not during the booster time, how people reacted to the, uh, the receiving the vaccines and how international organization and Sri Lankan government managed to uh, get the uh, enough vaccine, uh, vaccine to Sri Lanka. Yes, uh, Suranga. So, uh, the, as you say, very correctly said, uh, there was a uh, there was a uh, vaccine shortage at the beginning. I think it was it was due to various reasons because of the the we had relied on uh, AstraZeneca from India initially under Covax and also uh, direct procurement. But because suddenly the in, India had a second wave and they, they restricted uh, uh, in, uh, exporting uh, vaccines. But then I think we were able to catch up very soon because of uh, the, the Sinopharm vaccine that was uh, then uh, received by, by the government in large quantity. Then there was uh, prioritization and I think generally it went well. Uh, however, there were, you know, the original plan was not followed, but the, um, the demand for vaccine was much greater than the supply uh, and then of course uh, people were uh, 
also quite uh, concerned that you know the complications can happen and they there are such um, higher mortality and all that and they were going for vaccines and then uh, somehow other the uh, large uh, stocks of vaccine that were re, uh, uh, received later enabled the government also to do the uh, give the second uh, dose also within a short period of time uh, of course uh, with the required uh, gap uh, between the two doses uh, however what happened was after the third wave uh, when uh, the booster dose was uh, uh, announced there were all kinds of uh, uh, rumors that were spreading that on the safety of the uh, of uh, the vaccine particularly uh, the uh, uh, booster vaccine uh, uh, whether they were having uh, serious side effects and for example they are like uh, uh, it's going to um, cause uh, infertility importance and you know uh, blood clotting uh, mainly for the Pfizer vaccine and also um, this conspiracy theory that they are the people are being used as uh, you know laboratory rats to uh, test out uh, you know foreign vaccines and you know all all kinds of then uh, also the uh, health staff themselves and some government officers were not taking the vaccine. So that also prevented ordinary people from taking the uh, vaccine. Uh, so I think uh, uh, this is the situation now and uh, still I, uh, the, the coverage is uh, less than 40% and they were aiming to have at least over 60%, but we are also trying our best and uh, this uh, anti-vaccine campaign uh, is uh, going around very using social media in a very um, effective way, uh, whereas the uh, our national campaign to promote the vaccine is unable to uh, counter uh, this. So we have enough stock and we are also, uh, even as a civil society organization, we are doing quite a lot uh, in, um, uh, in getting the people to uh, understand that uh, this is uh, required and now uh, of course with uh, uh, omicron spreading i think uh, people have again started to uh, resort to vaccine we have seen during the last one week uh, again uh, uh, vaccine vaccination centers are being uh, having long uh, queues after several months so i think that we will overcome uh, but uh, we are concerned about the rising uh, rate because the mixing up of people uh, is happening, you know, large gatherings are still happening despite uh, they are not being legally allowed. Uh, but, uh, you know, funerals and, you know, uh, people attending funerals in large numbers and uh, weddings and other um, political functions. So these are alarming. So I think uh, we really need, need to change course. And we have also uh, been having a lot of discussions with the policymakers to. Uh, see, uh, you know, identify what are the better uh, ways of convincing the public to adhere to uh, health regulations. Uh, that's all I can say at the, on this, uh, Suranga. Thank you. Yes, I think time is running out. We have only a few minutes to go. Uh, I think I can just uh, ask one question from uh, Sudharma. I would there, Sudharma. Yes, I am. All right, that's great. All right. So my question is, uh, when I went through your CV, it says that you are a curriculum design for both UK and Sri Lanka. So with that strength, I have one question. Now, all this uh, uh, education architecture has been really transformed into a, another sort of a uh, way of making uh, their curriculum into this online education and even more how you should uh, uh, manage with the exams with the online platforms but my question is now during this pandemic uh, there are some other changes in terms of the uh, the children's uh, behaviors especially working with others and uh, even their playtime and uh, even uh, associating with the electronic devices. So how do you think that uh, the education curriculum, or oh, do you think that education curriculum most structure should be changed according to, for instance, 
uh, how they should uh, deal each other. Now, you know, Sri Lanka, um, according to my knowledge, the education has not started in 100% in full, in full gear way. So with your experience, do you think that how we can really transform or how we, do we need to do anything for the education curriculum in terms of this pandemic uh, impact? Yes, of course. Um, then, then need, there's a very, very big need of changing, changing the curriculum, curriculum to digital, digital curriculum and learning from virtual platforms. However, it it can be done in countries like that because it, in countries like this, UK and the first world countries, this is not. A big issue, but um, how how can it be implemented in the countries like my my mother country? It is it is a very big question um, because of the facilities and the nature of the education. We are very much into um, so social education, community education, and all. And the, there's no way to facilitate facilitate the rural area schools in rural areas. It is a big big issue. That I could say one few examples from hearing the education back back home. Some of the teachers couldn't do any online lessons because um, in rural area teachers don't they don't even have teachers themselves didn't have mobile phone usage. But however. The, the teachers used to do, some of the teachers used to do that. They, they asked children to come to the school, put it in a big screen using their mobile uh, to teach and the, the children who can join from the school. And sometimes it is just on top of a tree and then you can't see anything. It's, it's technicalities were happening a lot. And then it affect the curriculum, of course. But the fairness is not there because the children are sitting the same exams from the highly facilitated schools um, in Colombo Candy, yes, and then the rural areas as well. So curriculum has to have a massive change to cater all these things, of course. Even here, um, uh, you know, as um, um, even as a first world country, there are rural areas, um, they didn't have these facilities. So curriculum need to be designed to cater all these needs, which is kind of happening. I can't say that it's not happening because in Sri Lankan education, these days they are educating, educating, trying to design the curriculum to educate teachers to use these virtual platforms and also uh, kind of a big, big change. But I don't know how long it would take. And the, uh, and the one thing you ask about the the playgrounds and the, they're, they're just uh, social activities. Yes, it is such a dream. I don't know in 10 years time, these children who are virtually at school, but not at school really in, in and the lacking experience of the community, the smell, the, the other ch children's uh, kind of the affectionate hardships. How can it affect the society is a very big question. Yeah, I really agree with um, the mental health changes in, in any country. So yes, it, uh, it, is, it, is, um, it is a big, big question to answer. I think we all as human beings need a change. This is what I think, not as a kind of professional curriculum designer, but as a human being, this, this COVID and pandemic took us to a different era. And that has to be good and bad uh, issues, but still life goes on. So. Let's hope that this will help um, the future right. generation. Okay, I think uh, it's time to wind up this seminar. This seminar is titled uh, Faith-Based Organization. And 
COVID-19 pandemic uh, in Sri Lanka. And before concluding, I should thank to all the panelists, uh, Dr. Ari Ratna and uh, Sudharma and, uh, and Tudor. And meantime, I should uh, really mention the organizers of the York Hope Consortium. Uh, that's Indrajit Roy from politics, Sanjay Bhattacharya from history and, and Chambers from English. And uh, finally, I should thank uh, Dr. Anak Chakraborty for really networking these, the panelists. Uh, the least but not last, the, the University of York uh, AV team for uh, recording and really broadcasting this event in very successful way. So thank you very much for everyone and uh, it's good evening uh, and it's my pleasure for to uh, chair this meeting and finally uh, I think uh, uh, there are so many messages we can really uh, summarize in a, uh, in a in a future meeting as well. And it's really a good uh, thoughts and good substance for the future academic as well as some uh, sort of uh, administrative work, not even in the Sri Lanka, I know even the international level as well. So thank you very much. And uh, we are going to conclude the seminar and it's over to you, University of York AVT. Thank you.